The Ford Taurus, words that for most will conjure images of derelict, nondescript sedans and wagons that are one transmission failure away from the wrecking yards. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, the first generation Taurus and Sable twins literally changed automotive history and saved Ford Motor Company from near certain financial ruin. The lineage of the Taurus can be roughly traced to Ford's Falcon. Introduced in 1960, the Falcon and his Mercury Comet twin were the right cars at the right time to better compete with the expanding market share lost to more economical foreign rivals. Liberal use of parts bin sharing kept prices low and the Falcon was a major success for Ford. The Falcon was replaced by the Maverick, which tried to distance itself from the Falcon with more flowing lines and wild psychedelic color options. Maverick was a huge hit at introduction, selling nearly 600,000 units in its first year. From the Maverick's basic platform, itself an evolution of the Falcon platform, came Granada. Granada featured upscale Baroque styling, but sales quickly declined as gas fears rose and the archaic, heavy platform produced mileage in the low teens. Ford produced another game changer with the all new Fox Body Platform Fairmont. Weight was substantially reduced compared to the Granada, and handling performance was widely praised by the press. Fairmont and its Mercury Zephyr twin could be had in an enormous array of configurations. Somewhat ironically, the second generation Granada was introduced on the Fairmont's Fox Body platform in 1981 and was marketed as an upscale alternative to Fairmont, though in reality changes were minimal and sales were never strong. Ford replaced the ill-fated second generation Granada in 1983 with the confusingly named LTD, which attempted to capitalize on the brand equity of the LTD Crown Victoria. Though essentially a facelifted Fairmont, interior refinement was impressive and was considered better than most rivals. Initial planning for Project Taurus began in the late 1970s, at a time when Ford was hemorrhaging money at the rate of $1.5 billion annually. Ford's reluctance to downsize its lineup as GM had done several years prior had caused serious market share loss during the second oil crisis. The recently introduced Panther platform models which included the Ford LTD and Mercury Grand Marquis were helping Ford's bottom line, but the mid-sized Fairmont and Zephyr models were already aging and their wheel-wheel drive architecture simply could not compete with GM's new X-Body offerings. Ford desperately needed a savior. The Taurus was an enormous gamble. Failure could have realistically resulted in bankruptcy for Ford. Despite the company's dire financial situation, it was decided early on that no expense would be spared in an effort to get the details right and avoid costly long-term damage to Ford's reputation. Ford was determined to avoid the disastrous introduction of GM's X-Cars which suffered massive braking system failures and numerous recalls. Early in the program, Ford realized quality was also important to win back market share from foreign rivals which now had 30% of the total market share. The European rivals were also starting to appeal to aging baby boomers who had grown tired of sloppy handling and complete lack of refinement. Team Taurus first met in August of 1979 at Ford's headquarters. It was an all-day meeting intensely focused on determining the fundamental concepts and details of Project Taurus. The biggest point of contention was front or rear wheel drive. Front wheel drive would add $1 billion to the overall cost of the project. Despite the enormous additional cost, GM had already set the trend with the X-Cars and Ford decided it unwise to buck that trend. Plus, front-wheel drive offers considerable advantages by allowing for a much flatter floor, resulting in increased interior space. Front-wheel drive also meant that the Taurus would truly be all new. The designers could start with a completely clean sheet of paper, rather than having to work around existing components to cut cost. At this time, it was decided that engineering, design, and production departments would be combined into one group for Team Taurus. This was a radical departure from tradition, where individual departments develop cars independently, an approach that inevitably leads to many costly and time-consuming problems down the line. This consolidated group effort would be vital to the success of Ford's move to front-wheel drive architecture. 
The basic parameters of the Taurus program were finalized in June of 1980. Rather than compete with GM's Chevrolet offerings, Taurus would instead go after models from Buick and Oldsmobile. This was a bold move for Ford, which was considered a rather blue-collar brand. Many company executives were concerned this more upscale target would raise costs both for the consumer as well as the company, and negatively impact an already precarious financial situation. Henry Ford II preferred boxy, formal styling, with lots of chrome, and anyone who differed with him on any subject was sent backing. One look at any Ford product from the late 70s makes it abundantly clear who was in charge. From Continentals to Fairmonts, the straight edge look dominated. Mr. Ford believed the boxy styling was necessary to disguise drastically downsized models, mandated by the strict federal economy targets. This is but one example of just how out of touch Ford was with the times. The fuel crisis had potential buyers leaving in droves for smaller foreign cars. The square edge styling also hindered aerodynamics, which further hurt fuel economy. Fortunately for Team Taurus, tone-deaf Henry Ford II retired only two months before the project started. The designers were given free reign by new CEO Philip Caldwell and President Donald E. Peterson to drop the square styling and draw up aerodynamic shapes that would aid in achieving strict EPA economy targets as well as appeal to a more youthful demographic. Styling concepts were reviewed and a general determination of the look of the Taurus was achieved in late 1982. When the first full-size clay models were reviewed, company executives came to the realization that the overall proportions could be improved. These seemingly minor revisions added a full year to the development cycle, but these changes were deemed as vital to compete with new models from GM, such as the Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra, which had quickly become a huge hit for GM after its introduction in 1982. And there was also the Pontiac 6000, which added a degree of sportiness to the mid-sized sedan market and was also selling well. These delays were even more untimely as they occurred during a year Ford executives declared a fiscal disaster of epic proportions. Further delaying progress was the determination that initial concepts were either too safe or too wedge-shaped to provide proper interior space. It was at this time that Jack Telnack was given the directive by Donald E. Peterson to scrap the initial exterior styling and do what he really wanted to do. Telnack was responsible for the styling of some of Ford's biggest hits, including the Fox Body Mustang and the radically rounded 83 Thunderbird. He put pen to paper and produced a car that would literally define the future of automotive styling, not just for Ford, but for the entire industry. The Taurus would become Telnac's most celebrated accomplishment, and his revolutionary vision literally helped save the Ford Motor Company from financial ruin almost overnight. The vision of the future began to come into sharper focus in 1982, with exterior renderings and clay mock-ups under continuous development and refinement. This mock-up from July of 1982 made it clear to all who viewed it that something special was about to be born, something from the future. Early spy photos gave the world a glimpse of what was to come. Corporate press photos made it official. The radical styling was actually nearing production. And by early 1986, people were rushing to Ford showrooms to drive off in this car from the future. In addition to revolutionary exterior styling, the Taurus team invested a great amount of time, effort, and expense to produce an interior that was unlike any other. The dashboard was praised for its logical, highly ergonomic design. Door and steering wheel switchgear were among the first to be designed to be controlled intuitively by touch. 
Sun visors were designed to provide both windshield and side window protection simultaneously, a luxury feature rarely offered even in expensive European models of the day. The seats were universally praised for their comfort. Extensive power controls were available for both driver and passenger, and the rear seat passengers benefited from genuinely useful space. Competitors often artificially inflated interior volume numbers by lowering the rear seat cushion. This caused discomfort for taller adults. The rear seat in the Taurus was actually raised to provide genuine comfort for all passengers. Other thoughtful and costly to manufacture details included a small storage box behind the rear seat, a standard rear armrest on most models, and a key chime that finally banished the annoying buzzer. The Taurus was also found to be amongst the quietest cars on the road due to extensive use of sound insulation. Louis Beraldi is widely regarded as the father of the Ford Taurus. He was one of Ford's finest engineers and his desire was to build the best car on the market. His efforts resulted in numerous awards for his proudest accomplishment. It is a shame his name is not more widely remembered. He was truly a brilliant individual. Prior to Project Taurus, Veraldi had recently completed engineering design work on the Ford Fiesta, a small car that received rave reviews for its road fill and its handling performance. Veraldi was given free reign to include expensive design details, such as four-wheel independent suspension, that was so well sorted, popular mechanics reported the Taurus wagon actually handled better than the Audi 5000 sedan they had benchmarked. The modified McPherson strut setup was a huge departure from the past, and proved to be money well spent. Veraldi also helped implement a system in which major components were pre-assembled in modules and then bolted together on the production line. And with engineers at the same table as the designers, the production line ran far more efficiently, with parts that were easy to assemble by design. Initially, Taurus was simply a code name that happened to be the astrological sign of Lou Veraldi's wife. After more than a year of testing various names with the public, the marketers determined Taurus actually was the right choice. Interestingly, other names considered included Probe, later to become the name of the sporty hatchback offering, Optima, later to be used by Kia, and the Sable was nearly labeled the Lucerne, a name Buick would later use. Anyone who grew up in the 80s will likely remember the epic jingle produced by Ford's ad agency, J. Walter Thompson. The commercials featured 80s anthem style music declaring that Taurus is for us and is exactly what we've been looking for. Images of close-ups detailed features that set the Taurus apart from rivals, such as the highly functional dash layout and the radical rear styling of the wagon models. So vital was success at launch. Manager of production and sales Louis R. Ross delayed the Taurus introduction multiple times due to seemingly minor quality issues that would have been ignored in previous projects, such as door and fender alignment issues. Every week of delay at the Atlanta assembly plant cost the company $50 million. Lou Ross was quoted by the press as declaring, Today we build on a quality standard. We start when we meet that standard. The Taurus launch was the genesis of the Quality is Job One campaign, and it was taken seriously, even if the initial costs were high. Nearing its introduction, Ford executives were more nervous than ever. Early focus group results were mixed. Much of the controversy centered on the grill, or lack thereof. Ford was so concerned, a traditional grill was tooled up and ready to go, just in case. As it turns out, Ford need not have worried. Upon introduction at MGM Studios in 1985, it was immediately clear the Taurus and its sable twin were about to send shockwaves through the entire industry. So advanced was the styling, many journalists in attendance were in complete disbelief that the cars on display were actual production models. Every other car on the market suddenly looked 10 years old. Ford's big gamble had paid off. The Taurus had saved the company and completely revolutionized automotive design in the process. Much to the dismay of the competition, 
the first generation Taurus would go on to outsell all rivals for many years to come and win numerous awards and accolades from the press. Ford had found its hero. And so it is the ultimate irony that first generation Taurus is considered generic looking to modern eyes, simply because nearly every car that followed was inspired by it. And that is the story of the 1986 Ford Taurus. My first of many tales I plan to tell featuring the stories behind some of the world's most beloved automobiles, as well as the underdogs of the automotive world. I hope you enjoyed. If so, please like and subscribe. I sincerely appreciate the support. who demand excellence in design and function. For all of us who will not compromise, Ford listened. Ford created Taurus for us. For us! Now there's an American car that has exactly what we've been looking for. Taurus! Now there's an American car with the shape and the feel we've never seen before.